Hello, everyone. Thanks so much for joining today's webinar. Uh, it's sponsored by Suzy and Micmac, our annual, or, or I should say our monthly State of the Consumer webinar series, but our annual special edition um, with the great folks from Micmac, who you'll hear more about in a second. Uh, today's topic is about Black Friday and Cyber Monday uh, and peak holiday shopping season. Is Black Friday dead? And what does it mean for 2024 spending? We've had a roller coaster of a macroeconomic environment over the last couple of years, and 2023 was no different. And the big question on a lot of marketers and business people's minds right now is where is it all headed for 2024? So super excited to dive in today. Um, and we have an amazing uh, group of guests who will provide no shortage of timely insights on the topic. Speaking of which, I'd like to introduce uh, my uh, great guest today, um, Rachel Tippergraph, founder and CEO of Micmac. Uh, Rachel and I have done this uh, webinar since 2020. Uh, it's our highest rated every year. Rachel is an esteemed expert um, in the commerce CPG marketing space and has a great startup, which she'll tell you about in a second, as well as Carolyn Nephew um, from Reckit, a company that both Rachel and I uh, work with, uh, who's the director of full funnel consumer engagement at Reckit, which is one of the leading CPG uh, products companies in the world. Uh, I am the founder and CEO of Suzy. For those who don't know what Suzy is, Suzy is an end-to-end -end consumer insights platform that allows major marketers to have their finger on the pulse of the consumer in real time to empower uh, better, more informed decisions across any uh, cycle of the product development life cycle from innovation to R&D uh, to ad testing. Rachel, tell us about Micmac and thanks for joining. First of all, it's great to see you again. Thanks for having me again. Uh, so I'm Rachel Tippograph, the founder and CEO of Micmac. Micmac is a commerce enablement and analytics software company. If you've ever been in an environment like Meta or TikTok or CTV, your brand website, you were given the power to choose where to check out, Amazon, Target, Walmart. That's us behind the scenes powering it. And then as a result, you can see that end-to-end -end customer journey from impression all the way down to basket level sales data. And like Matt said, we get to work with great brands like Reckitt, and we work with over 1,200 of the biggest brands in the world. Thanks so much, Rachel, and thanks again for joining. Can't wait to uh, dig in. Um, and let's talk a little bit about Reckitt, Carolyn. Thanks uh, to you as well for joining. It's Rachel and I both agreed it was so important, we thought, this year to have the brand perspective. Um, and so we're really excited to hear your insights. But tell us a little bit about Reckitt and your work you're doing there. Well, Reckitt is um, a compilation of about, I don't know, 24 or more brands. I work on the health business. So we're, we're um, there's three different business units. We have the hygiene group, which has brands like Lysol and Airwick and Finish Dis Detergent. And then there's our nutrition group, which has, you know, Enfimil Baby Formula. And then I work on the health brands, which are anything from sexual well-being, you know, um, mm -hmm. lubes, condoms, Mucinex and Delson, which are our upper respiratory products, Biofreeze, and then VMS, which is brands like Airborne and Move Free. So at any one given moment, I could be talking it, um, I could be talking about condoms or coughs. So, you know, it's a very interesting, you know, array of, of brands, really successful um, world, you know, some of them are global brands and, um, you know, very, you know, in everybody's, everybody has a record product in their house. Yeah, keeps life interesting, I'm sure. <laughs> Um, so we're going to jump into uh, right now, you know, the topic du jour, which is um, the data that we have recently seen collectively um, from Black Friday and Cyber Monday in the overall shopping environment. Um, and, you know, the first question is, how can brands use the data from the shopping season for a successful 2024? Because obviously the best marketers right now are uh, data driven. So we really want to empower you with the learnings we have um, to help impact your plans and the way that you're looking um, at your year moving forward. Um, so let's talk Talk about Black Friday and Cyber Monday first and foremost. Um, data we saw so said that 83% of consumers had planned to shop during Black Friday, Cyber Monday, and actually only 71% of consumers uh, did shop. I actually read an article this morning on CNBC that really explored the notion of doom shopping, meaning that you know all the signals that we're seeing from a macroeconomic environment show that you know, we may be kind of at the end of the, of the boom cycle that came from the fiscal stimulus from COVID, right? We have record high uh, consumer debt. We have interest rates that are at a level that we haven't seen, um, you know, since I think it was 2008. So you're looking at interest rates are at a level, um, you know, that, that we haven't seen in 16 years and savings as a percentage of income are an all time low. Yet the shopping data that we've seen to date, at least through the first three quarters, hadn't really indicated that the consumer has really um, been quite resilient this year with their spending, but 
you know, maybe we're starting to see the cracks. Is that kind of how you read the data, uh, Rachel, in terms of the, the intent to shop versus who actually did shop? Yeah, I mean, at Micmac, we have this saying, which is America likes to spend, they don't like to save. You know, what we saw in our data this year is actually that consumers have been trading down. So there's two data points that we look at. Basket sizes this year in 2023 compared to 2022 are 20% less. And then from a price point standpoint, we're seeing consumers trade down in every single category, whether that means going from a hundred bottle dollar, a hundred dollar bottle of tequila to a $50 bottle, or even moving to private label. It's very clear that the pandemic slush fund is coming to an end. And that's why we're cautious about 2024. Yeah. And despite that fact, I mean, on a gross basis, you know, shoppers spent a record $9.8 billion, so nearly $10 billion in online sales. Um, I saw another thing online, which was interesting, where they showed a video of, I, I believe it was Target in 2018, where people were mobbing the store. And then they showed Target in 2023, and it, it looked empty. Although I'm sure when Target reports, they'll say they had a whopping online shopping season. Is the general shift, not to oversimplify it, that just more consumers are staying home and buying online? I think there's buying online. There's absolutely buying via the mobile phone, which also can influence offline sales. But I think another thing that we have to take into consideration with these numbers is that a lot of brands raised prices, right? Over the last 18 months, they were raising prices to essentially protect their margins, which is why looking at total dollars spent might not be the real indicator. Of where right. Because their interest. cost basis is also higher. Exactly. Versus looking right. at volume of sales. But I think right. Marilyn probably has a pretty strong perspective of what she's going to reckon. I, I think that, you know, overall, Black Friday sales were strong. Um, you know, we are a, um, you know, our, we don't sell big ticket items like TVs and, 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 you know, stereos and all the things that were traditional Black Friday, um, you know, big deal drivers. But we see that, um, you know, online sales are strong. Um, our, our Black Friday and our Cyber Mondays, we had double digit growth year over year. Um, but I think that consumer, you know, consumer confidence is still strong. But what I also read is that, you know, consumers are using this buy now, pay later. So even if, um, you know, almost a billion dollars in sales over this past weekend were, you know, were spent using, you know, Klarna, RA, um, and Affirm. So I think while people are out there still spending, um, they're doing so in a way that makes uh, a little bit more fiscal sense for them. But And then the other thing where we win from a consumer packaged goods standpoint is that people are also, while they're buying for other people, they're buying for themselves at the same time. So, you know, um, in marketplaces like Amazon and Walmart make it very easy to look for a TV and a face cream or, a, you, know, a, 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 um, you know, a cold medicine at the same time. So if if people are looking for deals, they're going to look for deals across the board because right. of how easy it is for them to buy anything in one basket, right? Right. It's the same human being who's clicking on the on the keyboard, whether they're buying a gift or they're purchasing for their medicine cabinet. And if they see deals, they're going to jump on it, which what, what I hear you saying is that kind of the CPG category has kind of crept its way into the holiday shopping, you know, momentum, if you will. And, and I like I've been at Reckitt for just about five years now, and I came from a tele, um, very big telecom before this, where you know Black Friday was very much in our vernacular. And when I came to Reckitt and I realized they they participated in things like Prime Days, it was like really, um, but it, it makes it just makes sense because if you're looking for a deal, you're looking for a deal across the board. You're not just looking at those big ticket items. If I can save on things that I buy every day, on cleaners, on facial care or, or supplements, I'm going to, I'm going to look to save on everything I can. Whereas I think the mentality may have been before I'm going to go look for, again, big ticket items. Like, you know, um, it's prime day. I'm going to go look for that, that new speaker or something really, um, you know, it's that, that electronic device that I can get at a really good deal. But now, Hey, I can get 50% off on, on airborne too, or, or a BOGO. That's great. Right. I'm going to add that to the cart at the same time. Well, I mean, and the physicality of being in a store, when you're a heat seeking missile going towards certain aisles where you're looking for the TV or the Xbox, maybe you're not even thinking about going to the other side of the big box retail where maybe your products are sold, but you don't have that same element in an online environment as well. It makes it so easy. This type of behavior is benefiting Walmart. Because if you think about Walmart in comparison to Amazon, where Walmart is winning is grocery. So yeah. the halo effect of these tentpole shopping moments 
is really positively Im impacting Walmart's position in the ecosystem. Absolutely. A, a big thing that we also heard is that consumers weren't really thrilled with the discounts they were seeing. Um, and that, you know, there was this one um, post that was going around where somebody basically removed um, from a big box retailer, essentially a Black Friday tag. And under it was basically the same price that they had had for their everyday sales that they had prior. And, and you know, that kind of went viral in terms of like, are the retailers really cheating the consumer and maybe misrepresenting what is really a deal and what isn't a deal. Rachel, I'm curious to hear your thoughts on that and if you saw the same thing. So, you know, in 2020, when we were doing this uh, exact webinar together, I would yeah. tell you that the most important thing that was informing a consumer's buying decision was product availability. Yeah. Now that's no longer the case. It's absolutely price. The consumer is demonstrating that they're extremely price sensitive, that they're even willing to shop at a lower price for slower shipping. And it's a strong indication of where we are in terms of the economy, which is why if you look at some of these great FMCG uh, brands right now, the top jobs that they're hiring for are revenue management. That's where the opportunity is to gain margin within their portfolio. Yeah, absolutely. It, the world has changed so much. You're right. You go back to 2020. It's like, can actually, there was a time when people couldn't get toilet paper, right? Yep. Um, in April, May, 2020. So, and, and now you're seeing a lot of these products kind of stock, you know, being overstocked on the, on the shelves uh, because they can't move them fast enough. Um, you guys had some great research at Micmac, Rachel, just about um, how consumers are interacting with social relative to the big buying season. We'd love to hear your thoughts here. Yeah. So because Micmac works with over 1200 brands, we're being appended to all of their media. As a result, we can understand where brands are investing their dollars. So during this holiday season on the far left, you can see the media mix of the biggest brands in the world. Nearly 73% of their media investment during Black Friday, Cyber One Day went to social. Social has become the third shelf. It is the place for product discovery. When we break social down by conversion rate, Meta still wins. And if you're looking at Meta's earnings over the course of this year, they have bounced back. They've really demonstrated the effectiveness of their ad products compared to other platforms. And you're probably paying attention to TikTok here. TikTok is absolutely a powerful platform, but when it comes to these sort of direct response, bottom of the funnel shopping moments, right. brands are pouring more dollars into Meta than they are into TikTok. Why do you, is that because of the more of the form factor of TikTok where you're kind of immersed in this short form video content where you don't want to leave it, uh, where maybe, you know, Facebook is slightly and Instagram to a lesser extent, slightly less immersive. So people are more likely to jump to a platform and buy something in the moment. I think it's the maturity of TikTok's sort of DR ad products. Yeah. Uh, Meta has invested in this over the last decade. They're connected to all of the major product feeds around the world. It's really easy to launch those ads and drive a strong CPA. While TikTok is really positioned right now in brands media plans as more upper funnel, essentially where they would put digital video or CTV, like that's where they're putting their TikTok dollars. What's striking to me, and then Caroline, I'd love to hear your thoughts on this, is that social really is dwarfing search. <laughs> And, you know, it is kind of the new search where we, it used to be Google, Google, Google for search. And, you know, obviously they own YouTube as well. So they're playing in this in this space on the social side. But is search like just really far less relevant? And do you see, Rachel, that changing with all the AI innovations that Google and Microsoft are making in that area? I think, well, I think there's a couple of things to unpack in what you said. Yeah. I think social, you, know, you hear about social commerce, right? Social commerce is um, is here. It's here to stay. You have some brands like nascent brands that are social first, social only. Yeah. But, you know, I think it took some of some bigger brands a little bit longer to figure it out. But social is um, it, it's your reach platform, you know, but it's a full funnel platform as well, whereas some platforms like a Google, they really play an up. They really play an upper funnel. Right. So if you. You can do full funnel through through your social. I agree about TikTok is a great platform. We found a lot of success with influencers. Um, it's a place for influencers and influencer sales, but those brand messages still resonate better, I believe, on, on Meta, um, whether it's whether it's TikTok or um, whether it's it's um, Instagram or, or Facebook. But you know, you really have this social commerce being a huge way of the way the consumer shops. 
I don't know if search is dead. I think search has evolved, right? There's there's just so many different ways, you, you know, think about search on platform, right? So you've got Google search, but then I think Amazon has, has a bigger search, um, you know, input than, than a Google does on certain days. People go to Amazon and search first now maybe versus Google. I don't think search is dead. I think search is evolving. Yeah. And we've got to keep up with the ways that the, you know, obviously consumer first, where are the consumers looking and you have to be there um, to be able to answer their, their queries. So Carolyn, at Google's biggest competitor is not Meta or TikTok, it's retail media. So a lot of the search dollars are now being shifted into environments like Amazon, Walmart Connect, Roundel. Right, which we're going to get into because, you know, you had really gone deep last year, Rachel, into retail media as sort of emerging, um, you know, channel that a lot of the brands were investing in. And that's only continued. So we're going to dive in. Uh, the last thing I'll say on, on this chart is Twitter X, nowhere to be found here. You, I've seen you on TV, Rachel, lots of times talking about how they're underrepresenting just how much that business has deteriorated. Any mm -hmm. thoughts on that? And then Caroline, is that somewhere that you would advertise right now? We have a moratorium right now on Twitter. Which, since before it's been X, we haven't we haven't been active on the platform. You know, we um, we just don't know that it's a it's a brand safe space. Um, so we've been um, holding back our dollars for a couple of years. From the Interesting. Platform. Yeah, uh, everything you just said encapsulates why we've seen our Twitter brand traffic essentially go to zero wow. since Elon Musk has taken ownership. There was a glimmer of hope in the spring when Linda Yaccarino uh, became CEO. Some brands decided to test the waters again. We've seen all of that go away, especially over recent weeks with Elon's actions on Twitter. Yeah, fascinating. Um, this is a story where sometimes, you know, the, the tail wags the dog, so to speak, and you don't really know if it's really landing in the business world, but it seems through your data and just the focus group of one that Caroline gave us that it definitely does hold true. Um, you know, this goes to what you were saying, Rachel, earlier in terms of consumer shopping for smaller items this summer, which I guess also fits in the basket size. Another thing I think we saw during the pandemic is anyone who needed a TV in any room in the house, including the bathroom, bought it during the pandemic, right? So when you look at electronics, gaming devices, everyone loaded up and bought those things. And I think it probably pushed back the buying cycle of a lot of electronics because so much was pulled up when people were mm -hmm. stuck at home and we're still seeing the results of that. Yeah, we, we have a bunch of consumer electronics customers at Micmac and the reality is every five to seven years, you'll turn over your electronics. So we're waiting until 2025 to 2027 again. Right, because so everyone basically bought a new TV because they were watching computer. Netflix nonstop, yeah. right. Right, so it kind of pushed everything back. Yeah, and now you're seeing it show up in Best Buy's earnings. So it's, right. it's a really, really tough time for yeah. that category. And I guess, Caroline, to your point earlier, that could benefit you guys because you fall into that smaller shopping items. Not to say that somebody would buy maybe one of your brands as a gift, but maybe since they're not spending as much on those high ticket items, they do have money left over, even though they're spending less, to buy and take advantage of the deals in your categories. I think there's a lot of COVID behavior that, that's been carried through that helped some of our brands. You know, V and Clearasil, for example, um, you know, they say that the pandemic shot us ahead five years from an online shopping perspective in three months. Um, and, and not all of that behavior went back. So self-care, you know, um, th those things haven't, not, some of those businesses haven't returned to normal. So, you know, we are still seeing a lot of great uh, momentum on products like, you know, our, our waxes and our acne products. And, you know, even again, when you go back to Black Friday, there was a stat that like 20% of people still bought themselves a um, a personal item, a personal care item. So, you know, while they're buying sweaters and, and whatnot, they're still, they're still buying something for themselves. So I think we're still reaping the, I think in some ways, in some brands, we're still reaping the benefits of COVID. Um, so, you know, a lot of, like I said, that, that behavior didn't go back to pre-COVID after the pandemic ended. So some of our brands are really winning and, you know, we are still seeing a lot of online growth on some of these brands. It's so interesting because we, we talked often that the big term during COVID was like the new normal and no one really knew what the new normal would be. And in certain categories and certain behaviors, we did kind of revert to post COVID behaviors, but you know, I'm not 
taking this webinar from an office right now. Um, I know, Rachel, you, you're probably not taking it from an office either. Um, we both were before the pandemic, and I would imagine that has permanently in some ways changed the way that we purchase products, especially in some of the categories that wreck it and other FMCG players play in, correct? We still see a lot of, um, you know, online purchase, online pickup in store. Um, but then you also have, you have new players. Um, you know, the last miles become a very important, um, you know, vendor for especially our intimate wellness products. You know, we do very well um, with GoPuff and DoorDash, believe it or not, because some of our products, talking about more, more of our cold and flu products right now, you can't wait a day for them. If you're right. sick, you know, if you didn't pantry load or if your pantry loading from COVID has, has been depleted, then, um, you know, you're not going to wait a day for your, your cold medicine. Um, so you're either, you know, if you're going to order it from DoorDash, you're going to order it from, um, you know, maybe uh, you're going to order it at Walmart and pick it up in store because it's going to be ready in an hour. So some of that behavior has, you know, also helped shape some of the way consumers buy things. If you don't want to go into a store, there's so many other ways to have it delivered now quicker than even before the pandemic. Well, uh, Matt, I think there's a chart, maybe it's the next slide, that our data actually shows, uh, or two more slides, uh, where last mile shows up. But we can, when we get there, here we this go. This is the right one? There you go. Yeah, yeah. So um, this is Micmac data here, where you can see what retailers America shopped Black Friday through Cyber Monday, that entire time period. And if you notice on the far left, Drizzly and Instacart appeared in our top five retailers. So we work through a wide slew of categories, but what you don't see on here, for example, is Best Buy. So right. it really goes back to how wow. this cultural moment is no longer about toys or consumer electronics. It's really about deals on everything. Uh, and then you can see it further broken down by category. What's interesting is that, uh, as many of you know, Uber acquired Drizzly uh, this year. And you, we're going to talk a little bit later about the power of first party data. But the first party data that a company like Uber has is really quite unique uh, because they know where people are going and so much more about individuals' lifestyles. And I have to imagine that commerce is probably an area as well as advertising, which they recently jumped into. Do you see Uber being a player in commerce five years from now, Rachel? A hundred percent. I think that Uber is a first party data company. I think that Walmart is a first party data company and that these companies are going to find unique ways to build verticalized businesses on top of their first party data. And I think advertising is only the beginning of one of the businesses that they build on top of this data set. Right. And, and that's really the name of the game, right, is having that first party data, understanding the consumer, being able to serve them messaging in a contextualized way that meets their meets their lifestyle. 100%. So the other slide that we quickly skipped over uh, speaks to necessities, which, Carolyn, you, you know, you had talked about as well. And um, this is Micmac data as well. Rachel, you want to speak to maybe what was interesting coming out of this? Yeah. So here are the top categories that consumers purchase. So we get basket level sales data. So we understand what America is buying. Amazon, top two categories, toys and beauty. Beauty never used to be a part of the zeitgeist of Amazon. So they've made major investments there. Walmart, personal care, alcohol. So big cultural moment. You got people over for the weekend. Target, grocery and beauty. So it's really reflective of everything that we were just talking about, that this is a moment to buy all of your life's necessities, not just gifting anymore. So who are the who are the companies that aren't the, I almost said the losers, but let's be positive. Who are the companies that aren't the winners coming out of this? Because if Target's making such big strides in groceries, is that coming at the market share of traditional grocery stores or convenience stores? Like where is the share coming from? Yeah, so I think you know, grocery is unique because typically local wins. Right. So you'll go shop at your local grocer to buy milk, but you'll go to Walmart to, to buy everything for your house. I think the, the interesting thing is who's losing is specialty retail. Specialty retail is really struggling because you no longer just have to you don't have to go to Ulta to get a great deal in beauty. Right. You also, the death, of, death of the mall, too. Right. They, they used to thrive off malls. Yes. And so I think there's going to be um, a reimagining of what specialty retail is. You already see a lot of them building out marketplace businesses. 
because they need to diversify their merchandise to drive bigger baskets. Right. So would that be like an Etsy, for example, that, you know, because they're kind of a specialty retailer that is a marketplace. Yeah, I think Etsy is a unique breed, right, in terms of its value proposition in the ecosystem. But, you know, to give you an example, uh, you can shop uh, Ulta at Kohl's, right? So people are really trying to figure out ways to expand their merchandising portfolio. Yeah, totally makes sense. So moving on, we talked about retail media and, you know, it's growing importance uh, for companies that work with the big box retailers and rely on them for a big percentage of their volume. Um, you know, we're seeing that's projected to continue to skyrocket. Uh, for those of you who don't know, retail media is essentially the retailers leveraging their footprint, both online and physically, to essentially um, produce what is the new circular, right? It used to be that if you sold in, let's just say, Best Buy, they had a Sunday circular, you'd buy ads in that circular and they would distribute it in all the newspapers. And it was a way for kind of these retailers to get money almost back um, for providing these merchandising opportunities. And now we're seeing it on a grand scale. Um, Rachel, you had talked about you know, this being a growing category last year, and it certainly has continued to prove out. What are you seeing in the world of retail media? Yeah. So, you know, last year we surveyed our customers and we asked them how much of your total media spend went to brand media versus retail media. And last year they essentially told us that 25% went to retail media, 75% to brand. We then asked them to project it into the year 2025. It was the inverse. They believe that 75% of their total media investment is going to go to retail media. Wow. Yes. For many of our customers, we are now, and it's 2023, at 50-50. So this is a seismic shift in the industry. And it's not that the advertising budget is getting larger. It's that dollars are shifting between- Where are they coming from? Are they coming, is it coming from TV? I would imagine that would be the first place they yeah. would take from. Linear TV, search, right? If you think about retail media, it's a big player in search. Um, and there's now a lot of discussions if it's also gonna come from environments like social and programmatic. It's getting blurry, and you're also starting to see this reflected inside brands organizations where marketing and sales are coming close together and sometimes they're even sitting under one leader, whether it's the CMO or the chief customer officer. But Carolyn is living and breathing yeah, That was this. my next question. So uh, tell us I, what's really going on. Yeah. Yeah, I think retail is going to continue to be an important part of what we do. I think our and it depends on the retailer, right? Not every retailer is equal in what they can offer or, or how they work with brands. But I think that we're going to be um, increasing our investment um, with, with, with key retailers as time goes on because you can, you can use their online and their offline world together and create these moments that matter. You have a big product launch. You, know, you can use their network. Their data is obviously um, the number one asset that they bring because not only do they know who their shopper is they know who they're who they're what they're buying what competitors they're of yours they're shopping um so from a digital perspective you can target really really well all of the things that you'd like to do um you know broadly that you really can only do with with certain sets of data but then you can also lean into their in-store and bring things to life in a way that um you know, you can't with, with certain other partners. So they really allow you to um, really key up launches. They have their in-store media. They You can buy almost anything through a retailer that you could. They have social offerings. They have audio offerings, right? Programmatic. Um, the only thing you really can't buy through them now, I think, is really linear, linear television, right? So um, again, certain networks, not, not all are equal, but the really sophisticated ones can can do everything soup to nuts, including influencers, right? You can do, you can use Walmart influencers to launch a product. So I think that you're going to, it's, it's going to keep getting bigger and bigger every year. Now I can't say that our budgets match your projections, Rachel, right now, but um, you know, every year we are planning on, on this being a, an area of growth for our budgets. I, I, and I, no, our budgets are not growing. So it's really about how you do it smartly, how you lean in with the partner and, and, and get mutual benefits of, of the work that you do together. What I think is going to change um, in the ecosystem is, is a few things. One, uh, I'm noticing within our customer base that in the last two years, 
more of our customers are layering in retail media to their media mix models. And what's coming back is that retail media is not profitable. And the reason why this is happening is because retail media isn't just media. It's the total cost that you have to invest with your retail partners that they're putting into the model, like trades and fines. Um, so that's one thing that I think is gonna change the nature of retail media. The second is regulation. You know, retailers are unique because they are also the distribution channels for right. these brands. And there's a lot of players, you know, like the FTC who are starting to look into what's happening with retailers and retail media to try to make this a more ethical marketplace. Because and I it think creates unfair advantages for other publishers who don't have the scale in distribution and retail. A hundred percent. And, and also, uh, and you know, I'll say this because I'm not a brand manufacturer. I think that a lot of brand manufacturers feel that it's extortion because a retailer walks into their office, demands 20% year over year increase in spend. The brand says, what am I going to get for that in return? And the retailer kind of goes, I don't know. And that type of leverage is a really challenging place for a brand manufacturer. So I think regulation is coming in. I think that brands are getting more sophisticated with their models to start to have more of a strong negotiating position with the retailers than they've had the last few years. It's interesting because going back to the Uber Drizzly example, Uber is a company that has the touch points and is well capitalized in the scale where they can actually compete with a target Amazon or Walmart, which is why they're saying, okay, well, we have this massive user base, um, you know, captive audience, high touch points, volumes of first party data. Let's leverage that to, to sell stuff, right? Besides rides <laughs> and mm -hmm. they just gotten Uber Eats and now they're obviously getting in the Drizzly. So at the same time, I'd imagine that other companies like Uber are probably having their eye on, well, maybe we should acquire retailers to call on top of our platform. I don't know, maybe Pinterest would do it, right? So they could actually do the same. Like, is that where it's coming? Because yes, they're going to be regulated, but the other way the market could shake itself out is to have this consolidation happen between platform and retailer. I mean, you're you're definitely hearing rumbles of that. Um, Pinterest always comes up. Uh, yeah. That's all yet to be imagined. But sure. Uh, you know, obviously TikTok is making major investments in their own commerce and marketplace business. So there are unique models that are coming to life. Uh, it's only a matter of time to see what actually plays out. Yeah. You also see the publishers, you see Viacom, News Corp, I don't know, Condé Nast, companies that have eyeballs, mm -hmm. right? And have some level of, of influence. Could they, could they purchase an Etsy or a marketplace or something and then have this content to commerce model come alive? But, you know, in the advertising world, we saw for a while creative and media being separate, and then we saw mm -hmm. it merge together. I think for similar reasons, could platform and retailer be brought together to compete with these big players? Is something that's that's an interesting thought. I frankly hadn't surfaced until now. I don't know, Carolyn, do you have any thoughts on on that topic? I think it's possible. I mean, I think we're living in a time when things just change, things just morph and change so quickly, right? When you when you've got your last mile players who are getting into businesses beyond where the, you know, Uber, Uber was rides. Now it's Uber eats, probably yeah. Uber retail, right? Like, so anywhere to chase, um, you know, again, consumer need, right? So if consumers are there, you're going to, they're going to build it. Right. So if there's a way of, of marrying these two types of businesses to make it more seamless, it, it's probably going to happen. Right. Cause I think Rachel, what you go back to FTC, what you're saying is ultimately the manufacturers, you know, Carolyn's company included, needs options. And if they don't have options, then then you you raise the possibility of, I don't know if extortion is the right word, but it's leverage really, mm -hmm. um, of, of you're going to pay us X amount or your end cap goes away. Mm -hmm. But if they can take their end cap elsewhere, especially in a digital world where another company has similar scale, well, then it creates, I think, you know, a better marketplace where, you know, the, the balance of power might be, you know, rebalanced in a, in a fair and even way. Yeah. Now, this obviously takes time. I think more of the short-term actions that we've seen evolve over the years is governing bodies like the IAB try to create standards in retail measurement because that's another big challenge is that every retailer is grading their own homework and there's no third party that's essentially verifying the metrics. Yeah, absolutely. A big thing that, and before we get into predictions and then we're going to open up some time for questions as well, there was a while where a lot of big CPG manufacturers were really focused on direct-to-consumer. 
and you had P&G and J&J before it became Kenview as their consumer brands, were really investing heavily in ways where they could sell directly to consumers. And from where I sit, that seems to have kind of fallen off a bit. Um, is that something, Carolyn, that you guys at Reckit are still tinkering with? Um, is it a way to launch new products or is it something that you guys really aren't as focused on anymore? Well, funny story. Um, we are actually sunsetting our direct to consumer. Um, there you go. Right. Not every, not every brand has direct to consumer um, functionality. Not all of our websites sure. had it built in. We, we did have um, a vendor who is, is no longer going to remain in that business. That's why I love Micmac, um, because I can turn any of my websites into e-commerce um, in a minute. I think the issue is, how do you make it profitable, right? Because, you know, we are not, as as Reckit, we are not distributors of, right. you know, consumer distributors, right? So you always have to bring in a third party to do, to do that work for you. And it's really not, you know, we, we've had it on and off for, for many years, but it's never really been an area of true profitability for the company. So I, I won't say that it's never coming back, but but for the foreseeable future, um, we're, we're not going to have a direct-to-consumer offering on any of our brands. Um, again, things can change. We can relook at things, but I, I, especially for, for brands like ours, it's so much easier to just direct the consumer to buy them somewhere else or wherever they're, they're close to versus we can't compete with Amazon's either, right? Like we didn't have free shipping. We don't have next day delivery. So it's not really a, the best consumer experience. So I think that, you know, a lot, I, I can't speak for other CPGs, but, you know, we love the Micmac relationship, which allows us to turn any, any ad or site into e, in, in instant e-commerce where people can look, where can I buy this? Buy me, right? Buy zip code. So that's where we are at Wreck It. Thank you. I did not ask Carolyn to say any of this. So no, no, no. We did not plan not, on the no, but honestly, that. like <laughs> with, with a with a product like Micmac, you you can you can turn it on and sell to anyone. And then the great thing is from a, a company like Reckit, where we don't really get a lot of data. Now again, it's not first party data, but we know how many people then added to cart and, and right. proceeded to, to buy. So it gives us sales insights too, um, that we wouldn't have had. Right. Which then you can apply towards your other channels and ways that you target consumers. And we know if it's social that's leading the click or, you know, one time we had a brand, you know, just funny insights. We had a brand um, with a QR code on a CTV spot. It was our number one add to basket tactic. I'm like, CTV, like, you know, so you get those aha moments from a media perspective that you wouldn't have gotten without a, a technology like that. Absolutely. So, Rachel, is that something you're seeing more broadly? Yeah, uh, I think to, to underpin like the massive change in the ecosystem. So I kind of pegged the time period 2007 to 2019, which is when all these brands were born social first. They were essentially born on the backbone of Facebook ads. Why? Because you could put a Facebook pixel on a checkout cart and go find people who look like Courtney Parker, Albert, right. Palacio, yeah. you know it. Yeah. That playbook stopped working in 2020. It has nothing to do with the pandemic. It has everything to do with changes in iOS 14 and cookieless internet where the whole ecosystem changed from I automatically opt in to allow these apps to monetize my data to now I automatically opt out. So very similar to like GDPR in Europe. This really challenged D2C brands. And that's why now if you walk into Walmart, Target, Costco, Ulta, Sephora, all those darling direct consumer brands are now omni-channel and at mass retail because they need reach and qualified shoppers to gain scale. They can no longer do it themselves through D2C. So because of the changes in iOS 14 and cookieless internet, that is what's changed the D2C ecosystem. Yeah, when it was first announced, I don't think many of the people, even in the marketing advertised community, knew just how big of an impact. I think one thing they probably wrongly predicted was that there, since Facebook ads would be less effective because those cookies didn't exist. They would shift hours away from Facebook. I remember Facebook's, uh, which was then called Facebook, now Meta, their stock price dropped precipitately uh, on the heels of that announcement. But I think that they've come up with their own technologies to kind of work their way around it. And to your data, you know, it's one of the only games in town if you want to drive conversion. You got it. Yeah. So let's, let's get into predictions. Um, you know, great segue here in terms of first party data is going to become more challenging. Um, Carolyn, as a, as, you know, CPG 
um, manufacturer, how do you look at first party data and how are you going at, we talked about some of the things that maybe you're doing with partners like Micmac to go direct and gain some level of data. What are some other tactics and how do you look at first party data overall as part of your strategy? Well, first party data is very important. Um, as a CPG, you know, we don't have as much as I was used to at you know, my, my previous role in telecom where we had a billing relationship with every customer. Um, however, you know, we still find it something that we want to grow. Um, we have a few of our brands have really robust CRM programs that allow us to, you know, gather that data. How we grow that in the next year is, is very important to the company. Um, but we know that we'll never get to you know, a hundred million records or, or something, you know, as, as mass as that within our own BU, we've, we've got some now, you know, cross BU initiatives, um, building CDPs and, you know, not ignoring the space. Um, but I, again, we look at a lot at our retail partners to provide us some of that data that we can't, that we don't have on our own. Um, and, you know, with the cookie crumbling, it's, it's the race to figure out how to grow it as quickly as possible, right? Um, however, we're in a position where a, a lot of times we have to put um, a value proposition in front of the customer, like sign up for our newsletter and get $5 coupon or something. So we're looking now for different ways and newer ways to grow that data without having to um, you know, put necessarily put an offer. What are, what are the other values that we can put in front of a consumer in order to, for them to give us their data? Yeah. Would you agree with what you're saying, seeing that more broadly, Rachel, in terms of the tactics that are being taken? Yeah, um, I think everything I said earlier is the why it's becoming increasingly more difficult. And I think to Carolyn's point, marketers have realized that it's nearly impossible to collect enough first party data to reach 300 million American households every day. Yeah. And they understand the value of second and third party data, of which a lot comes from the retail partners. Right. So it's, a kind, it's kind of like damned if you do it if you don't, because those same retail partners are the ones that are pushing to spend in their platform. Now we're back to the vicious cycle. <laughs> exactly. exactly. Um, you know, we had talked at the onset of today's webinar just about how consumers are going to be more cost conscious in 2024. I mean, the reality is that nobody really knows. So many quote unquote experts in, um, in you know, high finance were saying that this year was gonna be a terrible year for the consumer and that we'd be in the midst of a recession right now. And so many things have happened um, on a geopolitical basis, you know, we, you know, with the wars that are going on in the Middle East and uh, with Russia and Ukraine that, you know, would have thought would have had kind of a, a rambling impact on the supply chain. Um, maybe they, it's, it's, it's still to come. So we, it, there's so much unpredictability in this market, but we do know the stimulus is running out. Again, we do know that debts uh, for consumers as well, as well as high interest rates are impacting them and their savings weren't where they're supposed to be. So, I mean, do, Carolyn, I'll start with you. Do you see the consumer continuing to be cost conscious in 2024 and how's that affecting your planning and go to market strategy? I definitely think the consumer is going to continue to be cost conscious, especially if inflation keeps up the rate that it has yeah. or, or stays flat. If they don't get any relief in other places, they're going to have to start cutting expenses. Other you know, obviously, private label is a is a threat to every brand that that we have. Sure. Um, but I think that for us, it's really about instilling the value of why why our brands, right? So um, it. You know, will we run promotions? Obviously, we'll run promotions on, on certain SKUs and certain brands um, in order to um, get ahead of some of the the challenges people have. But we also have value messages that we we can bring to life. You know, some people automatically, you know, we're some of our brands are premium. Use Snacks is a premium cold and flu product, but we're also a twelve hour cough product. So while we may while we may be more expensive than the other product next to you, that's a four hour product. So I think part of our job is to Make sure consumers understand the value of our product because you actually take less. You need to take less of our product. So when you look at it by dose, it's actually a cheaper proposition. So you can't really say that in five words or less on a social ad, but right. um, it's our job to try and get those messages across that there is an inherent value in our product, even if it may cost more. So it's it's all on the education and how we go to market with those messages that will help us, you know, ho hopefully continue our growth, you know, trajectory for some of our, you know, our more challenged brands. And Rachel, I mean, in terms of what are some of the strategies more broadly you're seeing, I guess, with brands based upon what we've talked about in terms of the state of the current consumer? 
Yeah, I think for all the brand operators out there, the big exercise is how do you build a nimble PNL? Yeah. Because no one You and I both, right? We all exactly. we all have to do people it, yeah. are very trepidatious to be locked into anything unless they consider it must haves. They they know like they're going to need an ERP system for their supply chain. Um, but when it comes to marketing, that's obviously where CFOs try to be more nimble. And for the marketer, they really need to put themselves in a position to justify the investments back to their CFO counterpart. And so I think that's that's the hard thing. But from planning for the consumer, I would absolutely put uncertainty and I would plan for it to be another year like 2023 in terms yeah. of conversion rates. That's what we're expecting. It's also an election year, which is going to have a mm -hmm. whole new bunch of wrinkles, yeah. probably will prop up. Um, a lot of ad spending with certain yeah. channels as well um, could increase CPMs towards the back mm -hmm. half of the year as well, which is something that I think marketers that spend on some of these online channels need to be cognizant of. Mm -hmm. um, and then this was interesting, and, and I can take no credit for this, this came from your team, uh, Rachel, that the E from e-commerce will be dropped in the near future and it will just be commerce. Thought this was fascinating. Tell us a little bit about you know what the thought behind this is. Yeah, I mean, we're no longer in the pandemic. E-commerce growth rates are slowing compared to 2020 and 2021, yet we're all still spending so much time right here. And so the relationship between product discovery, consideration, and purchase has really become fluid. You might start your journey online, but then choose to buy in a physical store. And we continue to see buy online, pick up in store grow within Micmac data. And so for us, we need to make sure that we can help our brand partners understand the omni-channel customer journey. And so that's why we really think we got to drop the E. You know, Micmac is commerce enablement and analytics, and it really doesn't matter where the consumer is. We just need to put ourselves in a position to enable and measure commerce for our brand partners. Right. I mean, there was a time where digital advertising and advertising were separate, and now you really can't advertise unless digital is part of it. So I think this is just a natural evolution of this, just kind of transcending to the world of commerce. Yeah. And I think it's going to impact organizations internally, right? Because they have some very hard and fast e-commerce goals. Like I have some customers that say 25% of our revenue has to come from e-commerce in 2025, but that world's going to become blurry. I think they're going to have to reopen those P&Ls and reimagine what it means through an omni lens. Yeah. It's fascinating. So to, to wrap up here, um, the one topic we haven't talked about yet, which is kind of the topic du jour in marketing in 2023 was of course AI. Um, and I'm curious from both of you, how you think AI is gonna continually impact the way that you look at interacting and engaging with the consumer and, and selling products to them. So Carolyn, let's start with you. I mean, I think for us, AI can take a lot of different lenses. It can be you know, interactive shelf talkers. Think about that. You know, yeah. when, when, you, when you talk about some shelves that are crowded and confusing. Um, and also just from, a, from an advertising creative, think about what you can do from an AI perspective with creative um, to really understand, you know, messaging to targeting and audiences and how that can really, you know, bust it open from, you know, testing five versions and blah, blah, blah. You can really just use AI to really get into the, into like what messaging really resonates with your consumer um, so it goes all the way from, you know, I would say supply and on shelf to experiential, you know, marketing and, you know, it'll happen. I don't think it's happened as quickly as we thought it would, as far as, you know, with, within platform and advertising, but I think it's going to be much more, um, integrated into everything that we do starting in 24. Rachel. Yeah, I think from AI, from a behind the scenes standpoint, it's already in play, right? It's replaced a lot of QA work. It's writing basic code. It's helping edit images. But it's interesting when I talk with our brand partners, they're very trepidatious about AI in creative. They have a lot of concerns around copyright. And then the other concern, which I find very interesting, is transparency with their partners. So this notion of, hey, are you now using AI to generate this creative? If so, then the FTE headcount charges should look different because you're no longer using humans. So I think it's going to change. In terms of agencies and vendors. Yeah. It's yeah. going to create an. Uh, they want to benefit from those savings and the, that exactly. efficiency. Yeah. yeah. So I think that's going to come into the ecosystem over the next year as well. Yeah. I think one of the big shifts that we've obviously seen since the dawn of social is that traditional advertising just isn't a long-term strategy, meaning interrupting a consumer when they're watching a TV show that they love 
forcing, you know, your unique selling proposition that you're 30% more absorbent or you have 360 horsepower, like consumers don't want to hear that anymore. And now they can just fast forward past it, right? Or usually not even see it because they're watching Netflix. So the way that brands need to build their brand is through content. And I think the growth limiting factor of content creation and really personalization, Kyle, and to your point, was really production capabilities and cost. Mm -hmm. And I think with some of these platforms, a, a pl amazing tool yesterday, I saw a teaser on, I actually posted it on LinkedIn called Pika, um, allows you to basically type in any type of video you want to create, um, and it'll just create it instantly. And I think if 2023 AI was about write me an amazing blog post or headline or copy, 2024 is going to be make me a movie, make me, um, you know, a content series or whatever it may be. And what are consumers looking at online? They're looking at video content. That's why mm -hmm. TikTok has such strong engagement. So I think the best brands that are going to be able to move fast and, and take advantage of AI are going to be the ones that do it in the realm of video um, in 2024. And video and AI equals personalization at scale, engagement at scale, and really driving through a whole new realm of ways that brands can communicate with consumers. So I think that's really the game. And I think with some of these tools, Rachel, to your point, the tried and true methods that brands had to, to generate this content through expensive agencies are really going to have pressure on them um, because there's going to be easier ways. Um, now, ultimately, you still need the insight, right? You, yeah. Putting it back to Susie, but you need the insight. And insight is the basis of any creative idea. And if you have the insight, then the, then the creative is going to hit. And if you don't, then it doesn't matter what you tell AI, consumers aren't going to really care about it. I like so it's going to be in, really interesting. Yeah, and I got to check out Pika. Yeah, yeah, check it out. Um, so we just got a question. Can you speak a little bit more about growth in retail media in light of its lack of profit? How do brands plan to measure this as they increase their investment? Yeah, I, uh, I'll talk about it from what I just see from the customer yeah. base. But Carolyn is uh, the real operator here. Um, for most of my customers, when they talk about retail media, they really talk about it through the lens of total cost to serve the customer. What are all the investments that we have to make with Walmart to do business with Walmart? What are all the investments we have to invest with Target to do business with Target? When you layer all of that in, plus the media, it comes back as less profitable compared to channels just like Meta and Google that are pure media. But there's a different dynamic with these retailers, which is, you got to do business with them in a lot of these categories. And so what they're trying to figure out is how can we have a holistic conversation around our total investment that we're making in our your business and not just look at retail media in a silo. And I think that's what's going to change is because these retailers have been approaching trade and retail media as separate and they're going to feel pressure from the brand manufacturers to start talking about things holistically. Yeah. So that's what I'm seeing from, from my sort of, you know, one outside seat from the day to day that brand operators have to deal with. And I could say we have made a shift at Racket, whereas until, you know, this year, we did have sales um, and trade negotiating our media partnerships, right? So um, now that it sits with my team. So um, mm -hmm. instead of just looking at what, what's being asked from us from the retailer standpoint, we ask back, right? So like, okay, you want us to spend X, let's see how, what can we do together? What are our big bets? Um, how can we, how can we make this a success together? Because it has been somewhat of a one-sided conversation and we want to make sure that we get combined, you know, obviously we need, we need our partners like Walmart and Target. So how do we um, approach them now in a way that is a two-sided conversation? So I think that's really what's important is communicating to them what you need from a media perspective and a business perspective and say, how can we get there together to give you that growth in investment? So it can come, it just, you just need to have a seat at the table with the retailer and make sure you, they understand what you need. What are your measurements? What are your KPIs and how can we get there together? Absolutely. Well, this has been awesome. We're, we're out of time here, but um, 
every year it, it is a highlight of our State of the Consumer series. Um, and Rachel, I just want to thank you for continuing to take the time and your busy schedule to join us and share uh, timely insights. And Carolyn, it was so great this year um, having the brand's point of view. And I think that was a, uh, a great idea. And, and, and hope to have you back, both you back again. Oh, thank you. Uh, in the future. It was great being here. Uh, absolutely. So uh, be sure to check out uh, micmac.com, M-I-K-M-A-K.com um, to learn why Carolyn's so super excited about how it's impacted her business and to learn about Suzy, suzy.com, S-U-Z-Y.com. This uh, webinar will be available to share with colleagues. We've gotten a lot of questions on that, uh, which is great because it has been so very, very valuable. So on behalf of myself, Rachel, and Caroline, uh, on behalf of the team here, thanks so much for joining the State of the Consumer uh, webinar series. See you soon. Happy holidays, everyone. Thank you Thank all. You.